I think we probably need to turn it down, though. How does this sound? Okay. Sorry, they're they're recording, so we have to use this so they get the audio, but it's not necessary for you. So, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, we're we're good to go. Um, thank you all for coming tonight um, in celebration of. Stefan Senegal when monsters tremble and in celebration of Stefan Senegal himself. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, Stefan is a, a Lafayette native and uh, he currently lives in New York City. So uh, I think that's important to acknowledge that, you know, an, a, a big part of our exhibition program is to find Louisiana and Lafayette expats. And, <laughs> and welcome them home so we can see how we're impacting the art historical canon, you know, and really celebrate that. Um, Stefan earned his MFA from the Maryland Institute College of Art and his Bachelor of Fine Arts from Howard University. Um, he's an artist in residence at, at the Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art um, in 2017 and more recently at Erie Arts and uh, Culture Artist Residency in Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, and then also at Antenna uh, Paper Machine Residency in New Orleans. And that was a really interesting project as well. Perhaps we can touch on that um, during our conversation. And then lastly but not least, of course, uh, you've, you've exhibited broadly, you know, the Rochester Contemporary Arts Center, in uh, Rochester, New York, the California African American Museum in Los Angeles, Allegheny College of Art Galleries in Meadville, Pennsylvania, and then at the uh, Washington National Airport in Alexandria, Virginia. So uh, quite the successful career already. And okay. Um, and, and so uh, I want to just uh, welcome you with a quick round of applause and then we're going to have a, a conversation centered on your work. At the end, uh, we'll have some time for uh, Q&A, but if something really seems cogent in the moment, uh, see if we will raise your hand and let's see if we can make that work in an improvised kind of way too, maybe. But uh, so welcome very much. Welcome home. Thank you all for having me and definitely feel, if you feel inspired with a question, definitely during the conversation, uh, I enjoy an uh, interactive discussion where we can all participate. Um, so I, I thought that the, a nice foundation for us to start from is to clarify some vocabulary that you use when discussing your work. Um, and one one term that you return to time and again is melanism. And so can you, can you kind of en encapsulate that to some degree uh, with a definition or at least how you understand it in the context of your work? So um, melanism is actually a, a, um, a disease that they, I won't call it a disease, but it's an it's a over, overdevelopment of, of pigmentation of, of melanin and it happens in animals in the animal kingdom and you will find it like for example you'll see a rooster and every part of the rooster will be literally black uh, one such example is in Indonesia um, and the, the rooster there is completely black including the internal organs right? and so the context I'm using it in my work has to do with the browning of the of the, the the American population, if you will, and how that's viewed in the context of, of whiteness in America in general. And so that's the that's the base there. And then how does creolization as a concept play off of that in your overall practice? Creolization for me is 
a stratagem of sorts. Um, it allows, and as you know, the Creole um, was mainly based here in Louisiana, and of course, out grew. We, 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 we think of the mulatto, the octoroon, um, and the Creole was able to exist in two spaces at once. They were able to be in both the white space and, and the black space. And so I see the Creole as a, um, as, a, as a Trojan horse, if you will, as a way to kind of navigate the, the, the system of, of oppression that, that, um, that the African experienced while here in the Americas after being enslaved and brought here. Excellent. Um, and, and so I have described your paintings as mosaics, almost as though they're like a, a self-portrait, an expression of yourself biographically and an expression of yourself from an ancestral standpoint. Can you talk a little bit about the elements that represent that? And then also uh, maybe explain afterwards, does that thinking hold up or is it too simplistic? It's probably a little too linear, if you will. Um, one of the things um, in terms of the work, it's a very nonlinear approach. Of course, there are work on these walls, but my practice in general is built around function and being active in the space and being active in, in my community. One of the issues I ran across um, as an artist coming from a certain community, have a certain, having a certain upbringing was that the, the community in which I was raised did not have access to the things that I did. So I'm, I'm in a gallery, but I would only see people that didn't look like me or didn't come from the same environment that I came from. And so w with that understanding, I began a journey to determine how to integrate who I was, the people from, from whence that I came, and um, in the sense of, of the Creole bringing those things together. And that spawned into doing an, a, a number of projects in different communities that involved my work, almost performative in a way, but I don't see performance as an issue. I see it as a, as a method of way of involving the people around me and what I'm doing, but also having a very particular purpose and function behind that. And so the work, even the work here on these walls reference that. Reference language, which is a very important part of, of identity. Um, and uh, they, they reference religion, um, as, you know, in a number of different things, as well as um, the, the pantheons of religions of which I was unaware of before I started to go on my journey, if you will. Um, so you, you, you touched on language, for example. Um, and we had a really interesting interaction with respect to language because um, my favorite piece, like so just so everyone understands the curatorial process, sometimes a favorite piece isn't on the first wall. Um, <laughs> So my my favorite piece over here is if our battle if if our battles had names, um, and I couldn't figure out what that text said. You know, I, I definitely was just uh, ill informed, and so you know, and and you weren't going to volunteer it, right? So yes, I didn't volunteer the information. No, and <laughs> but it was good. Because Not initially. It, it became discourse based, you know, mm -hmm. like we had to talk about, you know, that that's Wolof and that's uh, an, a language indigenous to Senegal. So, well, it's Senegamia to be. Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. Exact, and, and the reason why I tend to make sure that we reference the regions is because the way the, the continent was divided was based on colonization as opposed to the way they considered their land to be divided. And Senegambia is a makeup of Senegal, Gambia, Mali, um, Cote d'Ivoire, and a couple other countries as well. And, you know, it, and have, rather than just telling me, it became part of a discussion, it became richer, you know? Like, for example, you can't Google these words. Right. 
right. in America anyway, with American internet. And so it shows this kind of disconnect that you're talking about. It's a great illustration of the disconnect that you're talking about. Indeed, indeed. And trying to, on a case-by-case -case basis, um, fix that. You know, and so, you know, in some ways, not having the information spoon-fed to me as a curator is frustrating, but the end result was a really rich conversation and conversations we continue to have. Indeed. And, and so that performative element of your work, that was a moment where that really struck home because like us having a conversation was definitely part of the work. Um, and me learning about that language and, and the words that, the words meanings and, and things of that nature um, really drove home that kind of, that a gap that needed to be bridged. Um, and, and I think, you know, that point in terms of uh, when your initial question, and I kind of referenced it being too linear, too straightforward, if you will, um, that there's an importance in understanding how all these things co come together and how language influences identity in such a key way. Um, there are so many things that we have been unable to say or express as a community because we've been forced to speak a language that wasn't exactly our own, even though we found ways to integrate ourselves into the language. Um, when, I, when we were young, we had this thing, you know, in, in my neighborhood, if you spoke very good English, you were talking white, right? And so for a while, the, of course I understood the phrase in context to my, to my youth and my, and my colleagues, my peers, um, as, as a young boy. And as I grew up through the education system, it became less and less of a thing until I came upon a point where I understood that us as children in that situation actually had it right in terms of talking white, the notion of speaking a language that wasn't your own. Kids didn't know how to express that in, in an eloquent way but they understood it intrinsically that they were not speaking in a language that they were meant to speak or you know, that their ancestors were meant to speak. Um, and so that notion or that idea influences the, the perspective of creolization as a strategy of bringing back and bringing through things from before and melding it mixing it with the situation that you may be in to somehow exist, still exist, with a, some sense of identity, with some sense of, of purpose. And, and I think that that is, in an interesting way, ties back to the tradition of institutional critique mm -hmm. that really started in the 1960s in you know, really came to prominence anyway in the 1960s in American art history with respect to kind of critiquing what institutions are doing and what they're not. But it's, you know, it's so subtle. Like your form of institutional critique that it's hard for me to tell if it's more effective or less effective, but it's, it's really made me approach it the concept of institutional critique from a much more thoughtful perspective. Um, do you feel like it's more effective, less effective, or indifferent? Well, I would say I'm going to lean towards more personal bias aside. Um, <laughs> but one of the things I grappled with um, when you look at things like um, protests, for example, um, what does protests really do ultimately right um, protest is in a sense you are asking and begging for the opportunity to change your situation um, I find it far more functional to just change the situation right and so instead of asking for inclusion you know simply include yourself if you will look for the resources and the understanding to make your 
community richer in his knowledge from whence it came, if you will. And so for me, which is one of the reasons why I spoke about being in the neighborhoods and doing different projects in those, in certain types of neighborhood with certain types of communities, um, and engaging them in conversation and functional activities that not only impacted their actual daily existence, but also spoke to who they were as people from before, which is why the language piece was such an important part of that. And it is such a, um, it's such a, th it's a thing that you just don't notice. You don't realize how important language is, right? But um, just as an example, uh, which was a startling example for me as I started to explore this in depth, the continent of, of, of Africa, of the countries within that continent, 80% or more than 80%, their, their official language is a language from Europe, right? And so even their indigenous tongues are second to that. And that was a startling fact, but it was, it was interesting in, in a sense that it spoke to how pervasive the export of whiteness and westernization has been that it's reached the entire globe. Not, not without assistance from the African population that was brought to this country, nonetheless it is, is, it is a startling fact. And it's, um, it's, it's, not, it's not noticeable, it's not, it's not, because people don't even register that is the case because they become so comfortable in those habits and in the ease the ease of being able to speak from one place to the other without recognizing how damaging it has been for their identities and esteems as nations. So it's, it's really easy to talk about institutional critique and the imagery here kind of informing that, but we talk about activism and for those in attendance who don't know your work very well, at Stefan Senegal on Instagram, by the way, and then you can kind of start to get a sense of what you're doing, where, you know, to some degree, it's almost more service than activism. You know, like, When Monsters Tremble as a title is kind of setting up this kind of dichotomy of good versus evil, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and heroism is really important, and service is important to you, and so, to make it less abstract, can you describe maybe one of your, your service-based projects and what those actions were and then how that manifested aesthetically or from a performance standpoint before we go back to talking about the paintings just so that it's not lost in the okay. conversation? So um, we did a, uh, a project, I mean I have a couple, but I'll, f I'll focus on one and briefly mention another. Um, so we did a project in uh, South Carolina. And that project entailed teaching a group of young uh, black girls, and, I, and I'm using the term black because it's, it's easy to use at this point. It's not my, my, it's not my preferred term to use. Um, but we taught them self-defense so that if they were in a, you know, in a funny type situation, they could <laughs> defend themselves if, if they, you know, and also just teaching them the basics about getting around and, um, and so on and so forth, right? And so, of course, uh, I've personally trained in the martial arts for years. And so when you mention the phrase martial arts, immediately your mind goes to China or Japan, whatever the case may be. But uh, I had the privilege of learning martial arts from the continent. And in, in, in particular, um, there's a style called um, Angola, which is from Central Africa. A a a Angola, which is a country you may, may be familiar with, is also the name of a prison here in Louisiana, not by accident, okay? And so that style of martial arts, which is on par time-wise in regards to what was happening in China and Japan, um, was brought to the Carolinas and renamed Kicking and Knocking, right? And it was a style of martial arts used during enslavement 
by those who were enslaved as a method of retaliation against their slave masters as well as just competition amongst themselves. Right? And so South Carolina, the Carolinas was chosen specifically because that style was pervasive in, in those states, you know, back then. And so it was a connection to bring these, to teach these young girls um, this style of self-defense that reference the continent, reference their history, their identity, but was also functional. It also functioned in their daily lives. And having come up in a certain environment when you have to worry about where you're eating or what you're doing the next day in terms of clothing, shelter, you don't, you're not interested in things that don't serve a function in your daily existence. And so that was one of the challenges that I had to face as an artist, connecting my community to the things that I did, right? And so um, that was a big project for me to truly express that idea of a functionality of the arts of performance in communities like, like my own. And that required me to divorce myself from the linear line of thought in regards to, I'm gonna put my work in a gallery of white walls, as opposed to understanding my work as a web, if you will, that had tentacles that could reach in different areas as long as there was a, a through line or a center, um, a place from which is derived. And um, with that said, I was able to start to go, in, to go into these communities with a variety of different approaches that all spoke to the same bigger picture. And, and then the resulting images, documenting them, and also text-based pieces, do you view those as works of art Actually, no, I, I view those as uh, part of the documentation, journalistic, if you will, um, uh, ways of involvement. It's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, you, you have your people that come to the gallery, they take pictures, or you have a conversation about a work. Um, and that in itself is not the art, but it is an extension of the art. Um, so it's not a work of art from the from the European perspective of it's an object you can contain, hold, buy, and, and resell, if you will. But it is part of the art in that it is part of how a work lives and breathes, right? Um, for me, the work is uh, constantly living and, and becoming something more and greater with each, with each moment, with, with each chance to interact with, uh, with a view or with someone who is just participating, you know, that's, that's part of the performance. Well, you know, speaking about aesthetics and, and text, your titles are very poetic titles. Do you, are you good at remembering your titles or not? There are many, so <laughs> well, I, I may I, not remember <laughs> them all. So I'll leave that up to you. Well, <laughs> I, printed, I printed it out. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, it's really interesting because they're beautiful little, like, fragments of thoughts, sometimes a complete thought, but there's no sentence structure to them, there's no capitalization. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, can you talk about how you feel that shapes the viewing experience? Well... Plainly, I haven't considered how it shapes the viewing experience. However, it is considered in regards to how it impacts the experience of the work. The titles reference the work, but they also take you outside of the work. So it, it goes along the same, the same idea in regards to the, uh, the, the performance pieces that I do in these communities. Um, and in terms of the lowercase and the sentence structure piece, it, it's along those same lines of there has to be a through line 
in all things that you do within, and at least in, within my practice, right? And that through line is um, breaking down the, the hierarchy, the, the linear perspective that one might typically associate with the arts and starting to speak into and bring back the understanding of it as something that is part of the community in a meaningful way. And so the titles do that same thing. Um, uh, you take a, I'm taking away the capital letters, just understanding language as a very fluid thing. Um, and hierarchy often um, shifts understandings and understanding of a thing. When if you, if you remove hierarchy, you can start to understand things from the perspective of a role. What role does this particular word or phrase play in this sentence? Uh, as it relates to this piece and so on and so forth. And so I tend to approach all the work in that way in that no one part is more important than the other part, um, which, is, which is something that I do in the titles by having them all lowercase. Um, they all speak to each other and operate as a whole, um, which is why for me, the projects I do in these communities and the paintings on these walls are all part of one collective and perspective in, in regards to, of course, as you mentioned earlier, creolization and, and an amalgam of parts and objects that play to one particular purpose. Yeah, you know, and for, for people kind of familiar with coming to the Hilliard and looking at didactics, for example, um, I, I, there are about three really horrendous drafts of a curatorial essay interpreting your work and it just couldn't make the work linear. And so like visitors will see that we, we have an educational didactic you can take and, and read, but it's kind of broken into vignettes that are essentially, they're not necessarily in a particular order, but they work in whichever order that you read them. And so from an from a educational standpoint, being on a university campus and trying to be able to explain this work um, it was a fun and interesting process trying to achieve that goal while also, you know, we had to kind of bend to the will of the work, so to speak. And that was, that was really interesting. It was, that's not a question, but just uh, an ob <laughs> I guess an observation for people familiar with the, with the museum that, you know, I, I found it really rewarding. Um, now... I do have a, I have a question about color palette and choices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, can, you, can you talk a little bit about uh, your choices behind, you know, a largely red show and, and then uh, exceptions to that? Uh, I can give you a broad stroke. I won't get too deep into it, but um, generally um, the, the, the colors chosen have much to do with uh, certain certain pantheons that are on the African continent in terms of colors related to those perspectives, those religions, as well as just the, the simple through line of a color being chosen because it relates to, you know, blood and what blood means as a life force, what blood also means as a indication of conflict or strife whatever the case may be. And so understanding, you know, that one in particular is an easy one in regards to how it, it fits in both spheres. It's not just one thing. Um, it speaks to both ideas, you know, conflict and peace, um, life and the, the absence of that. And so th that was definitely part of the rationale behind choosing, you know, that color. And then, like I said, it's a, it's definitely a mix and amalgam of a variety of uh, different concepts and ideas that have a definitive through line, but the viewer, the audience can take it in any variety of ways. Um, and, and then speaking of taking work a different way, you know, your work is bound to historical context broadly, but then very specifically to you, can you Tell me a little bit about your connection to manga and G.I. Joe's. So when I, when, I was, <laughs> when I was young, of course, uh, as a youth, you know, we, we had 
what we had to play with. I had I had my little GI Joes. That was my thing, and um, we would, uh, or should I say, I would I would watch certain cartoons, and, I, and this influenced my aesthetic in certain ways. And so, in an understanding that and understanding why I was shifting the aesthetic when I would reinterpret it in my drawings as a youth. Uh, it was important to allow that to show through in the work and understanding the, uh, getting an understanding of the notion of what a hero was or wasn't. Um, so when I was growing up and watching the G.I. Joe cartoons and even playing with the toys that I had, I had an affinity for certain characters. I tended to like the villains more than I did what were supposedly the heroes. Um, and that was just, I was intrinsically drawn to that notion, to, to that. And as I um, you know, evolved and grew, I started to understand that in the context of the Americas, the African can be nothing but a villain. He, he or she is essentially a villain and or terrorist in the context of, of American culture. And the evidence of that is not only, you know, in, our, in you know, it's most evident in how we've, you know, been treated um, and, and the, and the, and the systematic oppression that has been embedded in the system to kind of prevent the African from going forward in certain ways. Um, to almost prevent any notion of identity, of, of longing, of, of nationhood, which is, which, you know, which briefly alludes to, uh, you know, my issues around, not issues, but um, the conversation around the use of, of black and or white as a designation for a group of people. Um, as you may or may not know, the notion of a, uh, of a white person or a black person didn't come into existence until maybe the 1700s. And so prior to that, white people did not exist. Now, there were Irish and there were um, Italians and, and Scots and the Polish, if you will, um, but white wasn't a thing. The reason why it came into existence was in opposition to Africanness, to, to an African, regardless of the country. Um, and so, and the beginnings of that started, of course, around class, funny enough. The, the owners of these various plantations are people where they had free labor slash indentured servants, which were mostly European. Um, there was a problem in regards to the, the treatment of both of them. And so the trick was how do we make the indentured servants who are mostly European feel a step above the Africans? The answer was whiteness. And so, in a, and if you look at that history, you understand that initially only the English were white, not everybody else. And maybe the Scots, I think they came afterwards. But when the Irish first came here, or when the Italians first came to this country, they weren't considered white. They were Irish or Italian. And sometimes, just flat out called black. But as time went on, it became a consequence of what's prudent in this case. It's the same reason why they started to identify and use whiteness and bring in the indentured servants because they needed them to be on their side. Because there were, there, were, there were several instances where the indentured servants and the Africans who were enslaved and are free sometimes would band together and revolt because of the treatment. And so it's like, okay, how do we prevent that? And still get either a very cheap labor force or a free labor force. And so that was part of that, part of that evolution of how those things came to be. And so we have to consider how 
we can reach back and understand our, our identities as things that are connected to places right? and things as opposed to a concept like race, which is built upon the notion of division. That was the whole purpose behind it. And now, so with that being the case, you know, and, and performance being important to you, you know, and this is kind of a funny question we talked a little bit about before because you weren't sure how you're going to answer it. <laughs> um, and so before we take questions, I'd, I'd like to ask you about your motivation behind often working on the ground when you're painting. And so that has to do with the notion of the, of the object. So the majority of my, well, I won't say majority of my work, but I've, I've done a great deal of, uh, of sculpture, you know, metal, if you, you name the material, I've, I've, uh, I've used it. And so for me, the painting is just as much an object as a sculpture. In order to engage it in that way, it was important to engage it on the ground because then I could surround it. I could go around it, I could deal with it, I could get on top of it if, if need be, and it became a thing. Um, it, and it increased the intimacy of contending with the painting, as opposed to if it was on a wall, it then becomes something separate. It then becomes something that's only, and this is, I won't say only meant to exist, but it, it gives a notion that it's only meant to exist on a wall within a white space, as opposed to being an object that you interact with. And so it's, an important, it's important for me, for my process, to follow through all parts of what I do. Um, all parts of the things I identify with, uh, and that goes pretty deep. I won't go into all those areas uh, today. But so, the, so the, how I deal with the work, how I paint, uh, what I paint, sculpt, you name it, the function of it has to exist in that same way, that understanding of an object that is not only functional in a sense, uh, but, has, uh, but has a connection to the, the person creating it, the person who engages it after the fact, the viewer, if you will. So mainly, the short and sweet of it is, as an object, I had to deal with it on the ground. Um, and, and, and so with that, I thought that, you know, the, the first question always goes to the artist because these are kind of somewhat scripted and then we always go off script. Is there something that we haven't addressed that we intended to? Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that. I think, um, and you can attest to this, um, so when I delivered the work to Ben here, um, he, he asked, he was like, so what's up, what's down? I was like, figure it out. <laughs> Whatever well, you think. <laughs> and it, a lot of, they all came unstretched. Right, right, they were unstretched. So Stephanie built, stretch, or Stephanie, Bethany built Where's that from? Uh, Bethany built the stretchers, and they're a little deeper than often cases, so that they have more depth, they a little bit more objectness. Right, exactly. Injected that was into part them. of the conversation we had. But yeah, so part of the collaboration. I've never before been tasked with assigning the orientation of, of paintings, right. because it, it's it's important to me as an artist, um, and then as a pupil as well, for when I'm working with a curator, or when I'm working with that a little girl that I'm teaching self-defense to, there has to be an interaction, there has to be a collaboration. It's, 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 not, a, it's not a dictation. Um, it's not a, it's not a, um, it's not a tyranny, if you will, and I'm not being tyrannical. But more importantly, we each understand our roles. There's no need for the hierarchy of do as I say. Right? 
but in an understanding of my role, just like that, that young lady who was learning self-defense, she understood that there was this, um, this, this knowledge that she was seeking that she wanted to understand. And my role was to help deliver that to her, and her role was to learn. And so as a collaboration between artist and curator, the curator is he or she is the in-between between the artist, the object creator, and the audience. And so it's important that those two individuals collaborate. Right? And this is just a perspective, a, a philosophy, if, if, if you will, uh, not a linear one in regards to how I'm going to interact with the curator. And so it was important to um, provide a certain degree of autonomy to to the curator to orient things as he or she saw fit, and in this case, he. Um, and so uh, that is a that is a, a big part. So the the question of is there, any, is there anything left? The reason why that all that was put together was to say that well, no, there's there's nothing, you know, left because what you ask is what you felt you needed to ask. Well, yes, you know. in, in true spirit of collaboration, Bethany and I and Misty spent some time trying to figure out as a group which was up. So I hope everything looks right side up. Oh, it, uh, it's, it was definitely it's fine. <laughs> it was definitely a, a, <laughs> a group decision. The, the, this is this is part of what it means to be a community. Part of what it means to be a community is that there's an engagement at every level of community from the smallest infant to the, you know, to the elders. There's a constant engagement. There's a constant recognition of the value of one's input. Um, and so in, in keeping with that notion, with that idea, when we were working together, this is a community, um, regardless of the misgivings or grievances of any particular member of a community, it still ultimately is a community, right? So the, the goal is not separation, but harmony, right? For us to determine a way to operate together. Right? And uh, that, is the, that, is the, that is the highest expression of civilization which is when people determine how to work together civilly and as a group. And in addition to how they work with each other, they must also, in the highest expression of civilization, determine how to operate with, with, with nature, with the things that exist outside, to have a, a union, a, a, you know, a harmonious, balanced uh, way of operating that ensures all parties are addressed and valued. Well, and so with that, I would say, is the community feeling talkative? Um, Irie. So the, the question just for those watching remotely is, is there, is there value in conforming or interacting with notions of whiteness? So the, the value there is, is built in, and that's a big reason why I look to creolization as a methodology of existence and inclusion. Uh, the Creole was a special group of people that were able to, once again, exist in the middle, on the line. But the importance of that had to do with not only survival, but, but evolution. No group of people uh, can claim 
to have all that is needed or all that should be. Um, instead, often, if you look throughout history, peoples, the most successful, and success is a funny phrase to use, um, bring in um, disparate ideas and, and ways of being to create an, an, an amalgam, which of sense, when in a sense, is, is, is the Creole. That's what the Creole, that's what the Creole is. So the value in, in the most functional way in the Americas, of course, was the, the survival of, of culture um, and potentially, uh, well, I'll, I'll leave it at that, the, the survival of our way of being, of our culture, of our understandings. One, one very easy example I'll just bring out, um, jambalaya, for example, is a uh, West African dish. The, the, f the beginning of that phrase, jamba, means to mix in Wolof, okay? And so the rest of it, I'm not sure where that came from, but the, but the point. <laughs> it came from somewhere else. It came from so. somewhere. I haven't, you know, put that together yet. I'm just talking about the, yeah, I'll give you what's known, what's fact. Um, and so that created or was the beginnings, not the beginning, but it's part of the beginnings of, of the culture that we have here in Southern Louisiana, which is embraced by African-derived peoples and European-derived peoples alike, or if you still use those other classifications, white and black, right? And so it by itself, a, a way of eating, its value was in the union it created, the civilization it created around the eating of this dish, among many others, gumbo and so on and so forth, right? But people don't always notice it that way. But that's the genius of creolization as a strategy because it exists under the radar and finds a way to include so many different things. Any other? Yep. Yeah. So uh, again, for people watching remotely, what was the motivation with respect to working and painting for this particular show? So with this particular show, I was interested in exploring line. The idea of line as a uh, way of division, as a way of creation, um, as, as, a, as a way of communication. And the reason why line became so important, the idea of a line and the shapes it may or may not create is because line is a genesis of language, right? And language being the, uh, the, the method or the vehicle of communication between peoples that are, that are alike and peoples that are different as well. And so the painting for me was an exploration of line. That was the main thing. So even, even the color, the, the, the pigments I use were, though all at once, the through, the, the main thing was line in terms of exploring the interaction of these lines. Um, and, of, and I've dealt with that concept in other ways, in, in other projects. I did a project in Rochester, New York as a matter of fact, and I was exploring the notion of signage, right? And signage relates to line. It relates to line because signage, signage or road, road signage, if you will, it, 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 it provides a path. It says, go here, turn here. Like, it, you know, let you know where things are. And so the, that idea, that bigger concept bleeds into this work as well, just the notion of uh, defining a space. It's the same thing signs do, it's what roads do. They, they define space and define how a community interacts, they define how a community travels. Right? And so in this context, in dealing with line, I'm dealing with uh, different ideas or different notions of community 
different members of the community that may be, you know, here walking with us and those that aren't, that aren't presently walking with us. Um, and so, but the main throughput of all of that is I was concentrating on lying. Michael? How do hands come into your work? That was the question out there, yeah. So generally speaking, a, a broad stroke on that is the, the, the notion, the idea that what separates the human from animals is their ability to build tools and to make things to, uh, to kind of you know, create a technology of sorts. And so, there, the, that notion became important because it's all, I mean, even though defense is something you could do hands or not, but um, th those ideas start to come into play in terms of the separation. But then in the same notion of, of understanding that separation, you start to understand a harmony between human, animals, and otherwise in terms of how they exist in the, the most ideal setting. Uh, but to answer that particular question, it had to do with creating an understanding or grappling with the understanding of the hand as a different, different it, it made the difference. It was the difference between what was and what is. It, it's, it's part of what has propelled the human to the heights that, that they have, that they have um, achieved. typically don't sign my work. Um, it doesn't even occur to me to sign it. Um, and so, and I, I think that falls into um, some of the concepts I spoke of early in regards to, you know, community and, and understanding and these, these works and the objects I create having a particular role. And in having that role, there is not a need to, how do we say, um, not a need to beat you over the head with said role, right? To say, okay, this is mine. You, you understand that because of the work, that the signature is embedded in, in the work, if you will, but it's definitely part of that notion of something about the signature reeks of a hierarchy that I'm not as interested in as much as I'm interested in the role that the work plays in a community when they engage it with a group of people when they start to investigate it. Right? Um, and so I think that's, that's, a, that's a big part of it for me. Well, I am getting a little restless, so I thought maybe we could, if anyone has any additional questions, we could all stand up and just kind of do it face to face as human people instead of with microphones. And um, but in kind of conclusion, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out tonight. It means a lot to have your support, and I, I hope you enjoyed uh, coming together with us. So thank you again. Thank you. <laughs>